off um, and turn the presentation over to Margo, who's going to be presenting Beautiful Country. Thanks, Margo. Yeah, thank you so much, everybody. Good morning, and thank you for having us. Um, so I'm just going to do a quick little launchy thing, um, and then I'm going to hand it over to Julie, and then we figured we'd kind of, I've, I've got a couple of questions for her that I hope you guys are interested in. Um, but yeah, first, I just want to thank you all for having us. Um, ever since I bought this book for Doubleday, we've been thinking about it, hoping to get it into the hands of students and curriculum. So it's really exciting to get that ball rolling and to think that you guys might agree with us. Um, so I'm not going to, because because Chi and Julie is here, I'm not going to waste too much time trying to wax poetic. Um, for my purposes, I'll just say that Beautiful Country is the story of Chi and Julie's coming of age over the five years from ages seven to 12 that she and her family lived undocumented in New York City after immigrating from China in 1994. So what immediately caught my eye when I read Beautiful Country on submission was the voice. I mean, that's what always catches your eye. But specifically, it was the way that Chi and Julie had so brilliantly mastered the childhood voice. And that's notoriously difficult. I've turned down hundreds of books where it's been done poorly, unfortunately. Um, but there is something of magic in the seamless and luminous way that Julie takes it on. And it's what we at Doubleday thought it gave such enormous commercial potential to the book and also what... I have always thought it gives it such big educational potential. So first, Chien is as charming as Harriet the Spy or Scout Finch. She's curious and mischievous and a little bit petty when a bully calls for it and smart as hell. Like all good classic narrators, she will make herself at home in your heart. And I truly believe that this book is a soon to be classic. I, I think it's written to that quality. But perhaps more importantly, in a memoir about immigration and specifically undocumented status, a child's voice does something really magic, which is that it allows for clarity and accessibility and empathy around a topic that has been debated beyond the dehumanization of its subjects. So when I think about Beautiful Country, I actually have finally started thinking about the cover of Educated, which I'm sure you all know very well, the little girl looking up at the silhouette of the giant pencil that is education, a mountain, whatever. Um, and from the very beginning, I started thinking of Again, as this little girl staring up at this giant brick building that's full of paper pushers and visa stampers and politicians, just this vast network and power structure that's beyond understanding. And a child's voice done right is deeply clarifying in that it is often devoid of context. What could the seven-year-old coming from China know about American immigration laws? But thereby it renders all the lies we've told ourselves about these systems moot. So with Beautiful Country, Chi and Julie has managed to write a book about a child looking up at a country from beneath it because the country has told her that that's where she belongs, despite possessing exactly what she needs to feel safe and succeed. So it's a book that you enter on the ground floor, no matter where you already sit on the political spectrum or the knowledge spectrum. And to me, that's a power that really can't be underestimated. And speaking of childhood voices, I also just wanted to talk about the childhood memoir canon, which I think we all know pretty well. We know how white it is. We know how rare it is that a new book is deemed worthy of being added to the ranks. I'm thinking of books that I read in college and high school, like Angela's Ashes, The Liar's Club, This Boy's Life, um, or more recent editions like The Glass Castle or Yes, Educated. Um, and this is absolutely like those books in that it's a compelling and intimate story of a child coming out of incredibly difficult circumstances by way of sheer determination and strength of character. And thanks to Jan Julie's incredible writing, line by line, I think you would have no problem, you know, placing this in creative writing classes or memoir classes. But what's most interesting to me is that when it comes to educational opportunities is the irony of beautiful countries' Americanness. Not only is Chi Julie now a de facto American writer by way of citizenship, but this is also a quintessentially American story precisely because of our country's denial of that status to the people who populate it. So that feels like a really meaty discussion to me for putting this story in American lit or American studies or Asian or Asian American studies or even government classes. It demonstrates the power that the phrase undocumented immigrants sorry, undocumented Americans is not actually an oxymoron. And it's my hope that this book will ring true to many of the millions of undocumented Americans, plenty of whom are in higher ed, often with no representation like Julie was, 
as well as opening the eyes of those Americans who think they've never crossed paths with someone undocumented or have never considered just how alike their contributions to this country might be. And lastly, I just wanted to quickly mention what I know Chian Joy will be too modest to say herself, which is that she is a powerhouse of an advocate for her book and for immigrant causes. And as you'll see for yourself momentarily, a fantastic speaker. She spent many years in the courtroom. So as a testament to the book's discussability, kind of, if you will, she has already been invited to two in-house PRH book clubs. She did one for interns at KDPG, and she's doing one for the entirety of the sales department in July. Um, and in the very best way, almost every single person at the intern book club was in tears at some point during her presentation. Even me and I had heard every story before. It was like, by the end, I felt like I'd been to a life coach session, a creative writing workshop, and a therapy appointment rolled into one. I, I had new plans for my life. Um, so in short, if schools need an author visit to complement the curriculum, she enjoys is going to wow them. And with just that tiny bit of pressure, I will roll it over to her. Wow. Thank you. I feel like I should quit now because there's no way I can live up to that. Although I will own that I'm, I'm very petty. So, um, <laughs> hi everyone. Thank you so much for having me. I am just thrilled to be here with you today. Uh, my only regret that is, is that we can't get together in person because I feel like remote meetings kind of calcify any dynamic back and forth conversation into a rigid one way speech. Um, so I hope that you will type in your questions in the chat as I speak or write them down because Margo and I have made time to have a more of a Q&A approach um, once I'm done. But before I begin, I just want to express particular thanks to Margot and Keith for their support and excitement about my book from day one. It's just meant the world, the absolute world to me, and I could not have been luckier to have landed at Double Day and, and Penguin Random House, so thank you. Um, I just want to open with a few questions for your reflection. What was the very first secret you ever kept? What is something you never let yourself think about? When did you first learn to be ashamed? As Margot mentioned in 1994, I moved to New York City from China at age seven. And for years thereafter, I lived in undocumented status and poverty with my parents. And I know that sentence came out pretty naturally just now, but I kept all of that a secret for over two decades. Immediately upon stepping foot here, I learned to be ashamed of my race and how quote unquote illegal I was. Beautiful country is a direct translation of the Chinese word for America, Meiguo. And it's about those undocumented years that I locked up in secrecy and shame for so long. But if I were completely honest with you, I've dreamed about writing this book even, those dec even during those decades of secrecy. I learned English largely on library books, working my way from the Berenstain Bears and Amelia Bedelia to Charlotte's Web through the Babysitter's Club to where the red fern grows and the giver. But in all of my beloved books, both the ones I discovered in the library and the ones assigned to me in the classroom, I saw no one like me living the life that my parents and I lived in Brooklyn. And as a kid, I wondered aloud if we were the very first people to have lived like this. I also dreamed about finding a book that might show me that someone else had done this and made it out okay. And in response, my mom never failed to remind me that that was going to be me. And that was the thing about my parents and about what really got me through those years. No matter how hungry I was, my mom never failed to remind me that it was all temporary. And no matter how scared we got, my father never stopped trying to make me laugh. And luckily in our situation, it was all temporary, but the shame of our secret was not. I have spent so much of my adult life thus far running from my childhood, lying about my past, burying my sense of self, hoping to find in that charade something that might finally validate my belonging and my worth. I grew up in a society that excised people like me from textbooks, from history class, from television, and from the literary canon. 
So perhaps it should come as no surprise that by the time I graduated college, I had learned to erase myself on America's behalf. I started pretending I'd never been undocumented and acted like I wasn't an immigrant at all. Something about the books I read and the discussions in class and the insistent absence of people like me taught me that there was something deeply wrong, deeply shameful and abnormal about me. And in some ways, this messaging was stronger in my adult life and my college years as an English major than it had ever been when I was a child. So I thought, hoped, and prayed that I could make myself normal by packing what had by then festered into the defining moments of my life into a hidden container in my brain. So I adopted the mannerisms of everyone around me who had never had to earn their belonging here, who had never had to question whether they were American enough. And by wearing their two large shirts and their two small hats, I hoped I could mold myself to be the right dimensions and size. Society by then no longer needed to whitewash my life because it trained me to do it all on my own. But then 2016 arrived. In May, I became a citizen 22 years after I first stepped foot in this country. And in November, the election woke me up. I was dismayed at the state of the country. I had only recently received permission to call home. But I also discovered that I had a newfound privilege, power, and thus responsibility to tell my story, as much for myself as for everyone else who does not yet have the safety to step out of the shadows. But of course, to tell my story, I first had to understand it, and that's a lot easier than it sounds. I don't know if you've ever tried to open up a storage shed that has been shuttered and abandoned for decades, but that's what it was like for me to start this project. I wrote my entire first draft on my daily subway commute using my iPhone while I was working 80 hour weeks to make partner at my national law firm. But here the lack of time actually helped me. I didn't have the luxury of pausing and wondering whether I was writing, whether what I was writing was stupid and thank goodness for that. My rule was that as long as I was on the subway or on the platform, I was typing even if it was gibberish, even if it made no sense at all. And even with that, I had to jump around the book a lot because some memories were just too difficult to tap into after so long in hiding. I took very long breaks, including an entire year at a time to allow space for the emotions that this book shook loose. But soon enough, I grew determined to unpack that entire rusty storage shed. I did it first by removing the easier to reach items, the happier memories, my first time tasting pizza, discovering the stray cats of Brooklyn, me dancing with my father, my little feet on his bigger feet, swaying to the song that he had written for me and the language he made up just for us. And in time, I was able to live it all again. I could feel the metal scissors I use in the Chinatown sweatshop my little hands shaking under their weight. I could smell the salmon as my mother worked in the sushi processing plant where her hands turned purple from soaking in ice water at, for 10 hours at a time. I could see the Christmas lights of Fifth Avenue for the first time all over again, falling in lust with New York City and the promise of the American dream. In writing this book, I tasted my long buried hunger and fear anew, but also saw the light my parents and I clutched, the jokes, songs, and hopes that kept us buoyant in the unpredictable waves of undocumented life. And here I also awoke to a liberating realization. By internalizing America's erasure, I had unwittingly locked up the beauty and power of those years along with the pain and the heartache. I read once that you cannot selectively numb your emotions, hang on to the good while excising the bad. It's all a package deal. I am a package deal. And I cannot simply weave the quilt of my life using only the threads that I am comfortable with. That weave is too loose to offer any warmth. For students who are just 
at the beginning of their identity exploration, the college careers. I hope beautiful country shares with them what took me too many years and a few gray hairs and fine lines to learn. And it's a really simple concept at the end of the day, one that applies equally to democracy, education, and identity. Students who passively receive their education tend to become citizens who passively participate in their own governance. And those who are too busy running away from something usually have no control or even idea of where they are heading. I tell you this, of course, not from judgment, but from firsthand experience. In the classroom and media, questions are as important as lectures and messaging, and omissions are as powerful as inclusions. And in life, what we never talk about, never dare to think about ourselves, is just as defining, and I dare say more so, than that which we readily embrace. But my memoir is not just this message. It is more than anything a journey. It's not a letter, but a train ride. Beautiful country is an exploration of what it means to make a home in America and most of all within ourselves. And perhaps even more than an immigrant narrative, it is a return to that wondrous and terrifying time of childhood. Back to that time when we were all still tender and open, still new to the armor and mass and shame that the world demands of us. This book is a voyage into the love, pain, and secrets of family, a flight through the confusion, resilience, and delight of coming of age. In the vein of Angela's ashes, which made us laugh through its heartache, beautiful country embarks on a special excursion into the childhood wounds, love, and laughter to hold the key to our adult selves and to the freedom that lies beyond the jaws of the past. And I do hope you'll join me on that journey. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gina. As I said, really good. She maybe should have been an actress also. Um, but so, you know, for you guys, higher ed people, I wanted to make sure that Julie kind of gives you the trajectory um, of her time after the book ends. So can you tell us where you ended up? Sure, yeah, so the book ends when we moved to Canada um, and I graduated, went through uh, the rest of junior high and high school in Canada. And Canada obviously I think is um, perhaps rightly concerned about brain drain. They're very worried about their students going to the US, but I was determined to come back here and live out my American dream. Um, but I have very little information as to the world of elite colleges in the US, much less how to get there. Um, I found out that the last administration of the SAT twos, which I didn't even know existed, was happening a week from <laughs> when I first discovered their existence. So I remember bawling and crying and then finding a way to register myself and then studying for a week and taking all three SAT twos at once, and that was um, fairly traumatic. But the culture shock was even bigger once I got to Swarthmore, which is where I went, ended up. Um, it turned out there was a whole world of people out there that I didn't realize existed, a whole world of uh, elite, elite schools like Andover that I never even heard of. Um, I remember the first, my first year in freshman year, um, these classmates were talking about riding, and I thought they were talking about bikes. But sure enough, they were talking about horseback riding, which I didn't realize was the thing. And we had a swim test. I think, uh, like many schools, Swarthmore required you to pass a swim test, but I had never learned to swim. So I had to I end up enrolling in a swim class. Um, and when I told some other classmates this, they said, oh, what, did you not have a childhood or something? And I don't remember even the names or the faces of people who said that, but that statement lived with me, has lived with me since. Um, but the swim class actually ended up being good because it it's naturally selected all of the inner city kids and the immigrant kids who had never learned to swim. So it, it gave me a, some sense of community and, um, in addition to not helping at all with my fear of water. So I never, I did graduate, but I never learned to swim. Um, but I was an English major from the get-go. I went into a first year honors uh, seminar on Jane Austen, I go into class, it's like eight students and one teacher, which I'd never been in such an environment before. 
And the professor asks us to do a close reading of a passage from Pride and Prejudice. And everyone immediately looks down and starts doing whatever a close reading is. And I'm just looking around being like, I have no idea what she's talking about. I don't know what those words mean. I've never heard that together in my life. I didn't know what a thesis was. I was so woefully underprepared. The only thing that helped me was that I didn't know how underprepared I was. Um, and I was lucky to be at a small school where, te where the professors actually really cared about uh, teaching. And that specific professor called me in after class one day and said, let's talk about what you learned in high school and didn't make me feel ashamed at all or that there was something wrong because I was still not, it was still not clicking with me that I was missing a huge part of the information I should have received in high school. And she just met with me regularly every day for months, just catching me up, getting me to where I needed to be. Um, and in so many ways, that first year of college was very much like my first year in America, where I didn't understand the language people were speaking or in the mores and, and systems that were around me. The other memory I have of that first year is going in to meet my advisor who was supposed to guide me through college. Um, but we didn't know each other. He knew me only from my file. And he said, what do you want to do when you graduate? And I said, I want to go to Harvard or Yale Law School. I had known that from when I was age eight and read about Thurgood Marshall and Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And he laughed in my face. He said, those schools are superstars. Are you a superstar? And I took that to be an actual question. I was like, yes, I am. And he's like, no, you're not. Look at your record. You're not. Um, and if I could count the number of times, if I got a penny and every time someone told me I was not outspoken enough or assertive enough or creative enough to be a litigator before I went to law school, I would not have needed a scholarship to go to law school. And if I got a penny every time after I became a lawyer, a colleague came to me to ask to make their arguments more aggressive, more creative, asked me to step into their court arguments, I would not need to work. So, it, it, thankfully for me, I was a very much a stubborn child who said, if you tell me I can't do something, I'm going to prove you wrong. Because if I didn't have that, um, and I, I think it came so much from my mother telling me that I could do just about anything I wanted. If I didn't have that, I think I would have given up um, partway through Swarthmore. Um, and I think a function of being an Asian woman, being an immigrant, is that people lock you into these boxes. Like maybe you can be good at math, but you can't possibly write this well. And time and time again in, in high school and elementary school, in my book, I recount an incidents, teachers accused me of plagiarism because there was no way I possibly could have written this well. I had a supervisor at my job who said that there's no way this you wrote this brief. And I was like, then where did I magic this brief out of? This is specific to this case. And these ideas that trap students into what they can and cannot be are so incredibly oppressive. And if we could liberate, I guess, our students into thinking about what they're not told about themselves and what they don't read in their curriculum, that is one way, I think, out of these rigid boxes that we all kind of end up locking ourselves into. I probably have spoken too much in response to this question because I know there are other questions. So I'm going to stop here. Um, yeah, I definitely want to get everyone to ask you questions, but I just want to say really quickly, what is it that you're doing? You changed your profession basically since us buying this book and the publication. What are you doing now? Yeah, I think writing this book reminded me of the reason I went into law, which was to be the RGB and Thurgood Marshall for immigrants. And I strayed very far away from that and my whole running from my past and pretending I was white and all of that. And I, I don't know, somehow made it in my head that I had to become partner at a firm. And the minute I became partner, I was probably the most depressed I'd ever been because I was like, wait, what am I doing? This is not what I set out to do at all. What I set out to do was to help children, to help immigrant children. So that's exactly what um, I'm doing now. I opened uh, my own firm focusing on education law, um, assisting children who need special accommodations um, through K through 12, and also um, with the ability to represent students in universities um, and employment against discrimination. 
So it's been thrilling and completely terrifying to to take this course, but I a uh, course in trajectory in my career, but I am very hopeful that the ex experience and expertise I've developed in the corporate world will will be able to guide me here as well. Yeah, and we could tell you a million other things, but I know we're coming up on time and I would love for you guys to ask questions if you have any. Jen, that was really amazing. Thank you so much. I have a quick question for you. Have have you spoken at any law schools or to any law students about the, the work you're doing now? Yes. So I spoke recently to the Northeastern University School of Law, um, and it was specifically with the affinity groups, the Asian law students, Black law students, Latino law students, a little bit about the work that I'm doing now, because I think you go into these law schools and it's all about change chasing the conventional idea of success, which is going into a big firm and making partner. And um, I understand their financial burdens to do that, which I likewise had, but understanding that at a certain point, we've accrued enough gold stars to do the thing that drove us to go into law school uh, to begin with. But part of um, that experience was very illuminating for me because I got to speak to current law students about the ideas and messaging that they are struggling with currently. And one, one thing I noticed was that um, it, it's very much the same things that I experienced over a decade ago in, in law school, but the more liberating or exciting part for me is that they're able to vocalize it and identify it, which was not something that I had the tools, the language, or the uh, self-awareness to do. And that gives me great hope in, in the, the changes that are happening in our country, in our professions, in, in every, every realm, financial, legal, what have you. Um, and it was also just after the Atlanta shooting. So we were able to connect about that and, and really talk about what it means to be Asian and grow up in America. I just wanted to say thank you for sharing your book. It sounds so engaging. I cannot wait to get a copy myself. But I'd like to know, um, <clears throat> I often think these things when I'm working with someone's, um, well, a memoir, true life story, what is your hopes that we could accomplish for you in the educational um, initiatives that we do? What would be what you would deem to be successful for you? I... I mean, like I said, when I went through college, even when I took Asian American literature class, there were so few stories that were told that were like mine. Um, I think the the issue of being undocumented and being a model minority are really complicated by the fact that the number two largest group of undocumented immigrants in our nation are Chinese immigrants. And that's just never talked about. Um, we are not just people who obey the laws all the time. We are not just people who are doctors and lawyers. The lowest income sector of our of New York City pop New York City's population are Chinese Americans. Mm -hmm. Many of us are on the streets collecting cans. I was on the street collecting cans, and to see a diversity of people reflected in our canon, ideally in just general literature class. Ideally, it would not have to be Asian American literature, but uh, anywhere. I think would have helped me a lot. I mean, I think about what I would have wanted as a as a fresh college freshman and just to see myself somewhere, you know, on the curriculum would have just been liberating and and whispered, whispered a message that maybe I could tell my best friend about my past, that it wasn't so shameful, that there was nothing inherently wrong with me. And and, and I want to go back to this idea of omissions. I, I, I would love for students to start thinking about what is not being taught to them. And to really challenge that and, and in turn, think about what they don't think about in their own lives, because that is where progress happens. It's the omissions when we focus on them where progress happens. I think it's really interesting. You're tipping on something that you probably are aware of, but I think that um, 
we probably have lots of work to do in this country about undocumented immigrants in school, the K through 12 system and things like that. And like, as you know, the colleges are in preparation for teachers, preparation for sociologists and social workers and things like that. And so I think that you really have something powerful here to sort of convey to people. And I, I really would like to place you in that, in that space for education because I think it's necessary and would be helpful for many. Yeah, I would love that. And there's so many legal rights that everybody has regard regardless of immigration status in education K through 12 and otherwise that immigrants just don't know about. I mean, I was, I was an immigrant attorney. I didn't know about a lot of this. Um, and so just having creating that conduit of co communication and conversation and availing the resources to the communities that that have least access to it would would be wonderful. Well, thank you for uh, sharing your time with us this morning. I think I was muted when I started talking earlier. Um, I would just like to say that I think, to, if you'll excuse the paraphrase, I think when I'm talking with potentially common read committees about using your book, the the line about being passively engaged with education leads to being a passively engaged in as in the citizenry. I think that will resonate with everyone. Uh, across the country, so I'm that that is how I will. That would be my elevator pitch. I mean, not read your book just yet, uh, you know, without being able to point to specific examples. But what what would you say in the book is perhaps a specific chapter that, if we had one one moment to open up the book, where where would you want us to point to? It would be probably the opening passage of the book. Um, so I open not with my first memories, but with my father's. He grew up in, he was four when China's cultural revolution started, and it was 10 years of turmoil where intellectuals were persecuted, landlords were persecuted, just about everybody. Um, Chairman Mao had had 16 year olds attack their own teachers and principals. It was a complete um, chaos and my father's uncle was 18 when my father was seven and he wrote an essay calling upon his peers to stop the madness to think about what they were doing because there was no guarantee that chairman Mao was going to make a better country for them and that he said chairman Mao was just preying on their naivete and the fact that they had been told to always just listen to the government whatever the government told you to do that's what you did but does that mean killing your teachers which is actually what happened um but of course when my uncle pasted this paper everywhere on street poles uh, the Red Guards came after him and he was imprisoned and beaten and tortured by the very classmates that he went to school with, the very classmates he shared lunch with. My dad um, grew up in all of this as his backdrop and he was determined to become a professor and make sure that he educated his students so that they, this kind of stuff never happened again to liberate their minds. And the way that he found that he could do that within the confines of China and its censorship was um, to become an English professor and use Dickens and Mark Twain's writings as a vehicle. But even then he realized that um, China did just completely wrote those 10 years that defined him out of the history books. It was not anywhere and he was not allowed to ever talk about it. Um, and that's, that's kind of a, an issue that I'm seeing reappear now in our current politics. I mean, I've been following the critical race theory discussions a little bit and a little bit disturbed by um, as a lawyer by states like Tennessee and Idaho's decision to pass laws that say you can't discuss critical race theory, because once you start with a government saying you can't talk about something in the educational sphere, that becomes a really slippery slope to um, censorship and and the ability to communicate openly about our country's past because it's what, what constitutes critical race theory. It could be a multitude of things. Can we talk about Jim Crow laws? Um, so that so the opening passage will give you kind of an entryway to that. But I think a lot of my childhood experiences that I endured personally might also mirror that a little bit. Just um, the books that I encounter throughout, and and my constantly searching for. Um, a reflection of myself and grabbing at what isn't there. Like I, in the giver, um, Jonas is sees things that other people don't. And and for me, that was the closest that I could get to be like, okay, this this person is kind of like me because he's just different. Or Anne Frank, 
um, who grew up in hiding. And obviously I wasn't in the Holocaust, but to me, it felt like, oh, this girl is in hiding and has survived. And, and so maybe I can do the same. So, um, yeah, I think the parallels between that, which was far away and across the world in China and what we see now in, in both current America and not too long ago, America, um, should be a, a, way, a conduit for, for that idea of, of challenging our passivity and receiving books and education. Right. Thanks. Thanks so much. We, we actually have to move on. Uh, and I just can't thank both of you enough. Thank you so much, Jen and, and Margo. You've, you've written an amazing book and um, we're really excited to promote it to the academic market. Thank you Thank so you much.